In today's Neville Goddard conversation, I'd like to explore my experiences with you applying fourth dimensional thinking, which is thinking feelingly from the premise of already having. And by that I mean acknowledging that you already have what you desire, already are who you desire to be. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. To articulate this, Neville wrote a wonderful book called Out of This World. So let's explore it today. Chapter 1 is titled Thinking Force Dimensionally. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, ye might believe. He says, Many persons, myself included, have observed events before they occurred. That is, before they occurred in this world of three dimensions. Since one can observe an event before it occurs in the three dimensions of space, life on earth must proceed according to plan. And this plan must exist elsewhere in another dimension and be slowly moving through our space. If the occurring events were not in this world when they were observed, then, to be perfectly logical, they must have been out of this world. So many of us have had these experiences where we witness in our imagination certain scenes in which it plays out. It could be conversations with others, life experiences. It reminds me of a time when I was in California a few years ago with one of my friends. We were walking around in Santa Monica. So I imagined that we would meet this woman and she would look a certain way and we would have a certain conversation. I remember saying that to my friend. And then sure enough, we ended up meeting this woman who was exactly like how I described her. When we ended up meeting the woman, my friend turns to her and says, you know that he actually imagined you prior to meeting you. And he said, he was also saying that you were going to have this conversation that we're having right now. And so the conversation that I was having with her was essentially that people appear saying the same things that we imagine. So to go meta, she was actually thinking that. She was thinking at that time about how others show up, reflecting what we imagine. So he says, thus, the question arises, are we able to alter the future? My object in writing these pages is to indicate possibilities inherent to us. To show us that we can alter our future, but thus altered, it forms again a deterministic sequence starting from the point of interference, a future that will be consistent with the alteration. The most remarkable feature of our future is its flexibility. It is determined by our attitudes rather than by our acts. So acts, behaviors, what we do, what we don't do, what we say, what we don't say, can be tracked back to what is imagined of the one cause within. Essentially, what do we say of the I am within? As we know, consciousness is one. Consciousness appears as and appears as all through imagination. What I mean by that is that people show up to reflect our imaginal activity. This appears in relationships, friendships, any kind of interaction. And so no shame and condemnation if what we experience with another person is what we can call undesirable as now is where all the power is. We have the ability to think feelingly now from the premise of already relating with that person in an ideal way. That's thinking fourth dimensionally. When we think fourth dimensionally, that leaves an impression on the subconscious mind. And some way, somehow, the unseen takes that, appears as, and animates all that appears as the reflection of what was imagined. Now, from the premise of having, in relation to, appearances. He says, the cornerstone on which all things are based is our concept of ourself. We act as we do and have the experiences that we do because our concept of ourself is what it is and for no other reason. If we had a different concept of self, we would act differently. So again, what we say, what we don't say, what we do, what we don't do, plays out to reflect what we imagine. Now, I've had 
images flash upon my mind's eye. I would say that particular experience was an image that flashed upon my mind's eye. This image of a woman flashed upon my mind's eye. I've also had experiences where I've actually conjured up images intentionally on my mind's eye and impressed that on the subconscious mind. And having impressed that on my subconscious mind, some way, somehow, it does lead to that end. My behaviors, my acts, what I do, what I don't do, some way, somehow, play out. That's because, as he says here, all changes take place in consciousness. The future, although prepared in every detail in advance, as in creation is complete, has several outcomes. And at every moment of our lives, we have before us the choice of which of several futures we will choose. So anytime we picture something, we have a preference right then and there to accept it as true or not. And this is in relation to people, environment, circumstance, or information. We're the ones imagining what we are relating to the five sensory experience. This is the spiritual view where we say, Consciousness is the fundamental reality, appearing as all that appears. A different perspective is what we can call the carnal view, where one sees themselves as the effect of the acts, as in this act or this appearance, whatever appears, determines what I should imagine next. A perfect example would be if a person looks around, let's say they're in a public environment, they're looking around and they're seeing what others are doing. And based on what others are doing, they're determining what they should imagine about themselves. In other words, they're playing this theater where it's, I'm going to look around, I'm going to see what others are doing. And from there, I'm going to see how I should imagine myself in relation to this experience. And then they accept that suggestion. And so what ends up playing out is the theater that reflects that. Now, what we've also seen is, in relation to Romans 12, 2, not conforming to the patterns of the world, the appearances, and then someone reimagining that environment or people in that environment experienced differently. Let's say it wasn't a pleasant environment. I reimagine. We've all done this. Reflect upon your life where you've done this. This book is helpful in making this more of a conscious thing to do if you desire to do it. So we've had these experiences where we walk into an environment and we could say it wasn't pleasant. But because we didn't react to past imaginal activity in relation to the experiences, thus identifying with that imaginal activity, we then say, how would we desire this experience to be? What would the feeling be like if it were true that I would experience harmonious relationship with others in this environment? And we capture that feeling, or we imagine what implies. Perhaps it's imagining having harmonious conversations with others in the room in that moment. And we capture that feeling of it being so. Then what happens is the change takes place in consciousness. We initiate the change within, and then it plays out accordingly. People appear to change. Environments appear to change. Our behaviors appear to change. How we relate to them, how they relate to us, how we behave in relation to them, how they behave in relation to us, changes to reflect what we imagine. And this is because we have developed ourselves, if we apply this consciously and experience this more often, to not identify with the imaginal activity that we're relating to the senses that is not ideal, as he says here. The habit of seeing only that which our senses permit renders us totally blind to what we otherwise could see. To cultivate the faculty of seeing the invisible, we should often deliberately disentangle our minds from the evidence of the senses and focus our attention on an invisible state, mentally feeling it and sensing it until it has all the distinctness of reality. This is Romans 12.2 not conforming to the patterns of the world, but renewing our mind. Because how we relate to the experiences is based on past imaginal activity. For example, a person may walk into a room and they may say they feel emotions of discomfort 
In other words, they might say it, I feel uncomfortable in this room. And so they might ask themselves the question, why is it that they feel uncomfortable in this room? Well, they may say that they've been in rooms like this before, where these particular kind of people were in these rooms. And when I was in these rooms before, the situation did not play out harmoniously. In that moment, they could ask themselves the question, does this have to be universally true? Is there a possibility that it can be different? Now, if they have a desire to imagine it different, they will conjure up in their mind's eye a scene that implies that the wish is fulfilled, which is what they truly desire. To desire is to have, which is to have that experience play out in a harmonious way. They're essentially, in that moment, disentangling their mind from the evidence of the senses, which they're the ones assigning imaginal acts to those five sensory experiences, which could be from past experience identification and imagination. And what I mean by that is experience the visible world through their five senses and say, because it was like this before, it will always be like this going forth. Now that only exists in mind. In other words, what they have planted in their subconscious mind were these imaginal acts in relation to past experiences in which they said people won't relate to them in a harmonious way if these external conditions are there. So it's up to them, really, if they want to continue relating to those experiences that way. They do have the ability to, in the moment, disentangle their minds from the evidence of the senses and reimagine it the way they desire to be. They may benefit in order to disentangle their mind from the evidence of the senses successfully, releasing the emotions, allowing the emotions to be, abiding as the silence for a moment, bringing themselves back to the stillness. And from that stillness, they're free. And from that stillness, they can imagine the world they desire to experience and experience it. Because as he says here, the spiritual self speaks to the natural self through the language of desire. The key to progress in life and to fulfillment of dreams lies in ready obedience to its voice. Unhesitating obedience to its voice is an immediate assumption of the wish fulfilled. To desire a state is to have it. So what do we desire? True way of being, the true self already fulfilled. And thus, when we acknowledge we already have it in imagination by disentangling our minds from the evidence of the senses, and more specifically put, in relation to past imaginal activity that wasn't harmonious in relation to the senses, we are free to be how we truly desire to be. By in this moment, thinking feelingly from the premise of having, that's prayer. Prayer is acknowledgement of what you already have. Now is where all the power is. And thus, we can imagine how the power appears. As there's only God, and only God appears, and appears to animate all that appears from imagination. Isaiah 45, 5-6 I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Chapter 2 is Assumptions Become Facts. So to recap thus far, we can assume that we already are who we desire to be now. We already have what we desire now. And this is a practice. The habit of capturing the feeling of it being true is a practice, one that becomes easier with practice. Part of the practice involves not judging by appearances. By that I mean needing external confirmation, as that could result in conformity. Again, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, One believes in the reality of the external world because they do not know how to focus and condense 
their powers to penetrate its thin crust. So as we've been discussing thus far, the appearances, we're the ones imagining what they mean. As in, even what I'm saying right now, you are imagining what it means to you. The words that you hear, you are imagining your relationship to this conversation. And what you think feelingly upon, you accept as true and appears in and as the outer expressions of life. And so, what do we say of the I am within us? Are we thinking feelingly from the premise of already having? If not, no shame in condemnation. Release identification. Abide in the stillness. Acknowledge that now is where all the power is. To reimagine the experiences the way you desire it to be as. As the spiritual self speaks to the natural self through the language of desire. He says, we have only to concentrate on the state desired in order to mentally see it, but to give it reality so that it will become an objective fact, we must focus attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality. One of the easiest ways that I found to do this is by asking the question, what would the feeling be like if it were true? For that feeling implies already have. Or you may create auto-suggestions such as, I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. And repeat it to yourself. You can record it, play it on loop before going to sleep. And what happens is you begin to accept that that is how reality is. Because reality is the way you imagine it is. And now is where all the power is, to imagine it the way you desire it to be. He says, when through concentrated attention, our desire appears to possess the distinctness and feeling of reality, we have given it the right to become a visible, concrete fact. He says, define your ideal and concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal, which means, I already have it. Thank you. I already have. Prayer is acknowledgement of what you already have, already being who you desire to be. What would the feeling be like if it were true? Carry on conversations with yourself and others now from the premise of already having. Those are ways we can, as he says, assume the feeling of being it, the feeling that would be yours were you already the embodiment of your ideal. Then live and act upon this conviction. He says this assumption, though denied by the senses. And we could say how we relate to what appears to the senses. For example, what does rejection mean? Well, I speak a lot about in the entrepreneurial space. Rejection means optimization data. Here's how I can reimagine this experience in a way that moves forward to actualizing the vision. Because as he says, the assumption of already being what you desire to be and imagining ideally in relation to experiences, if persisted in, will become fact. He says, in meditation, you imagine that they see you expressing that which you desire to be. So to clarify, he says, let me again lay the foundation of changing the future, which is nothing more than a controlled waking dream. Number one, define your objective. Know definitely what you want. And this is where we go within. We ask ourselves. We disentangle our mind from the evidence of the senses and ask the question, what do we truly desire? No shame or condemnation for having desire. Desire means we already have. Our true way of being is fulfillment. Thus, there's nothing wrong with desiring to be or experiencing fulfillment as the outer expressions of life, be it relationships, business, all areas of your life, because the spiritual self speaks to the natural self through the language of desire. The key to progress in life and to the fulfillment of dreams lies in ready obedience to its voice. Why do I believe this is the case is because the desire arises from God and is fulfilled by God and is harmoniously related to the desires of all. As I always say, who you desire desires you. What you desire desires you. Practical example from my experience is in the entrepreneurial journey, when I have a desire to create a product or service, 
I find that others appear saying that that is what they were looking for. They desired to have that product or experience. And so having accepted the desire as fulfilled, others appear automatically. What I say, what I don't say, what they do, what they don't do, reflects my acceptance of that desire as fulfilled. So again, number one, define your objective. Know definitely what you want. Number two, construct an event which you believe you will encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. Something which will have the action of self-predominant. An event which implies the fulfillment of your desire. So it could be someone congratulating you on your success. This is a wonderful business that you have. You've helped so many people on your business. You have wonderful clients. And everybody's so happy and joyous to receive the benefit from you. These are the kinds of imaginal acts that I would have, which actually ended up playing out as others saying those exact same things. Same with relationships. You have a wonderful relationship. You have wonderful friends. I captured the feeling of it being that way by imagining others congratulating me on my success. And it appeared that way. So we do this in number three. He says, immobilize the physical body and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep. So right prior to going to sleep, then he says, mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now. And that's the key here and now. You already are who you desire to be. You already have what you desire. That's how we think feelingly, fourth dimensional thinking. From the premise of having, all power is now. And all power is now to think feelingly from the premise of having. And so he says, propose imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now so that you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you now to realize your goal. And so we must understand that the imaginal act is fact, as he says here. Power of imagination, chapter number three. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John eight thirty two. He says the ancient teachers warned us not to judge from appearances because they said the truth need not conform to the external reality to which it relates. We are called upon to deny the evidence of our senses and to imagine as true of our neighbor that which makes us free. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know the truth of your neighbor. We must assume that he is already that which he desires to be. Any concept we hold of another that is short of their fulfilled desire will not make them free and therefore cannot be true. By this method, first desiring and then imagining that we are experiencing that which we desire to experience, we can mold the future in harmony with our desire. This is how we generate the experience of heaven on earth, by imagining others the way they desire to be which is their true nature of fulfillment, by imagining ourselves the way we desire to be, our true nature, fulfillment. And so we acknowledge that we already have what we desire through desire. Desire is acknowledgement of already having. Thank you, I already have. What would the feeling be like if it were true? And then what appears? Harmonious relationships, more so each day, on a continuous basis that reflect in fulfillment. And so he says, desire and imagination are the enchanter's wand of fable, and they draw to themselves their own affinities. They break forth best when the mind is in a state akin to sleep. And so it's easier then to accept the suggestion. And so there's no one to change but self. It may be experienced to some as tempting to point to visible causes. There is no visible cause. There's only appearances of the one cause within, I am. As stated in Isaiah 45, 5-6, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So what do we say of the I am within? One might think that they're this little island appearing on this earth and that they're not one with all. Yet if we release in that moment 
the identification or that personal identity, we acknowledge that there is a fundamental reality from which all appear to arise from. And so he says, My mystical experiences have convinced me that there is no way to bring about the outer perfection we seek other than by the transformation of ourselves. Because what are we conscious of being now? Others appear to reflect what we're conscious of being now. We see this again and again and again in our personal experiences. And so I recommend noting those experiences down so that you can continue to, with repetition, call that this is how the relationships appear. If it was forgotten for whatever the reason may be, again, no shame and condemnation. Simply accept now is where all the power is. And so what do you desire the relationship to appear as? Knowing that all power is now, there's no one to change but self. And by that I mean the concept of self, which is, again, what is the self being referred to? Pure consciousness. And so how do you appear? What do you appear as? You can right now, regardless of the past, which is purely imaginal, regardless of the future, which is purely imaginal, regardless of what you relate to the now, which is purely imaginal. Transcend that and acknowledge that you already have all that you desire to have. You already are all you desire to be, except that you are that way now. And you'll notice that what you do, not do, say, not say, will be more authentic. And relationships will appear that way as well. He says, as soon as we succeed in transforming ourselves, the world will melt magically before our eyes and reshape itself in harmony with that which our transformation affirms. And so all appear to play the roles to reflect what we imagine in relation to them. As he says, those who help or hinder us, whether they know it or not, are the servants of the law which shapes outward circumstances in harmony with our inner nature. So the cause is within. What do we say of the one cause within? Remember, I can of myself do nothing. The Father within doeth the work, which means this personal self, the body that appears, the individual mind, are emanations of the one cause within. All are emanations of the one cause within. And so by praying as though we already have, everything changes some way, somehow. The personal self appears to be animated, all appears to be animated from the relationship to the one cause within. He says, it is our conception of ourselves which frees or constrains us, though it may use material agencies to achieve its purpose. He says, because life molds the outer world to reflect the inner arrangement of our minds, there is no way of bringing about the outer perfection we seek other than by transformation of ourselves. To attempt to change the world before we change our concept of ourselves is to struggle against the nature of things. There can be no outer change until there is first an inner change, as within, so without. Everything we do unaccompanied by change of consciousness is but futile readjustment of surfaces. And we've experienced this. I've experienced this in my life, certainly. I try to force change in the external, create unnecessary force, stress, frustration, create conflict in relationship with others. When I then realize that the cause is within, and what am I saying of the cause within? What am I imagining of the cause within? I then realize that I change. I accept. I already am who I desire to be. I think feelingly from the premise of already having. It leaves an impression on the subconscious mind. Some way, somehow, as all subconscious minds are interconnected, all in harmony with the one universal cause, what happens is others then appear in a harmonious theater to reflect the change within. He says, the circumstances of my life are too closely related to my conception of myself not to have been formed by my own spirit from some dimensionally larger storehouse of my being. Intense meditation brings about a union with the state contemplated, and during this union, we see visions, have experiences, and behave in keeping with our change of consciousness. This shows us that a transformation of consciousness will result in a change of environment and behavior. As soon as we succeed in transforming ourselves, our world will dissolve and reshape itself in harmony with that which our change affirms. So in summary, now is where all the power is. Now is where all the power is to imagine yourself the way you truly desire to be. To accept that you already are all that you desire to be. 
that others relate to you in a harmonious way, the way you truly desire, in mutual harmonious relationship. That's the true way of being. Now, in this moment is the opportunity. So we do this today and any moment if we find ourselves out of that state. Why? When we are in our ideal state of consciousness, by accepting, anytime a desire arises, thank you, I already have. We already are who we desire to be. Anytime a desire arises, thank you, I already have. Capture the feeling. What happens is a few things to name a few. Number one, you'll find if you're about to react, to enter into a different state, you'll be aware of it and you'll continue to abide in your ideal state. You won't conform to the patterns of the past. Number two, others appear to reflect the state, ideal, harmonious relationships wherever you go. This has been my experience and this has been my experience with everyone that I've spoken with who've applied this information. So I trust you found this video to be helpful. Let's conclude this with an auto-suggestion to further encourage. You could say, now is where all the power is, to imagine who I truly am, which is love, happiness, peace, bliss, fulfillment, upon acceptance of already being that. It appears that way as far as my senses perceive, in relationships, in environments, in outer expressions of life. As I go through these experiences, I continue to accept my imagination, what I saw myself as specifically in my imagination, as the reality. And as I continue to remain this way, I transform self. As a result of transforming self, the world rearranges, reshapes itself in harmony with that which my change affirms. If you would like a copy of this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk with you soon. Take care.